Not nine now, Sully. <laughs> seven. <laughs> All right, y'all turn to Daniel 7. We're going to pick our study back up. And one thing I want to mention before we move into the next little section here is that what Jesus called Himself. He called Himself the Son of Man. Now, of all the titles used of Christ, the one that's most often in the New Testament for, for Jesus is Christ. Second is Lord. Christ means anointed one. Uh, Lord is basically Adonai from the Old Testament, or sometimes it's Jehovah. But this, time, this term, Son of Man, okay, it occurs not about 91 times, something like that. But anyway, almost every occurrence is Christ Himself. It's His favorite title for Himself. He calls Himself the Son of Man. Now, understanding this title is important because, yes, He's talking about His humanity, but that's just a little piece of it. It's not just referring to His humanity because what He's proven is He said, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath day. In other words, I have authority even over the Sabbath day. What did He really just say? Back there in Genesis 2, when the Lord sanctified the Sabbath day, who was it? It's Christ. He's saying, I am the Son of Man. Now, this title above everything else comes from Daniel. Y'all turn to Daniel 7. Daniel is having a vision. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision, and he saw the governments that were going to come up until Christ, right? And he sees them in the form of a big, wonderful statue made out of precious metals. Because to a lost person, this world is great, isn't it? And Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. Well, sure it was good. But Daniel sees the same period of time plus the rest of history. And Daniel sees each one of them as a wild beast. Now, how do you look at government? A oh, wild beast, yeah, for sure. Um, a wild beast wanting to eat and devour, and that's what governments do. But when Daniel is talking about these governments, in verse 9 he says this, And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And we find this in Revelation, same thing John sees. He said, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment were set, and the books were opened. Folks, we know who this is, don't we? He says, Now I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. And he's talking about all these things that are going to come. And he, he, Daniel is seen, Nebuchadnezzar saw up until the coming of Christ. Daniel is seen up until the coming of Christ as well as his kingdom rule all the way to the second coming. But notice what he says in verse uh, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near to him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, when did Christ come before the Ancient of Days and receive a kingdom? When was He given all power and all authority? When He ascended up. Folks, when He ascended up, He went up to His coronation. And in His coronation, He received power. That's why He said, All power has been given Me. It's why Paul right here said He was King of King and Lord of Lords. And so He rules up here, doesn't He? And yet, what's the title that He used for that? Son of Man. Now, what He's really suggesting here is this. Who's the first son we find in the Bible? Adam. And Adam was the head of a race, was he not? Yes. What is Christ? The head, of the head of a new race. In His resurrection, He is the head of a new race of people, a new body of people. He's the Son of Man. And the Jews, when they heard the phrase, Son of Man, they knew it's the Messiah. 
And so when Christ says, I, the Son of Man, have, have uh, authority even over the Sabbath day, what is He claiming to be? God. God. And folks, this is not new. What had He just claimed to be in Luke a couple weeks ago? He said, I've got power to forgive sin. And they said, only God can forgive sin. And it's like He said, yeah, you got it. Yeah. You see, he's proving his Messiahship, isn't he? And here he's doing the same thing. When he claims authority over the Sabbath day, he's not t taking the Sabbath day and saying, I can start it and I can stop it. And I'm st No, he's not saying that. He's saying, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm the one that instigated the Sabbath day, and I'm the one that understands why I implemented it, not you Jews. And he says why. Now, in doing that, the very next thing he does is he's going to heal this impotent man. This man's arm is withered. Now, there's lots of ways you can, you can consider a withered arm. I remember working in a grocery store when I was young, and a guy come through my line one time, and he had no lower arm. He had two fingers on the end of his elbow. And I'd never seen anything like that. It was kind of shocking. That's a birth defect. In this case, withered here, it, the Greek word means dried. Um, I said, I tell you what, I had it. We called him my uncle, but he wasn't really my uncle. He was my cousin's uncle. But we called him uncle. He was so big when he was born that it broke his shoulder. He was born in a strawberry field in Hammond, Louisiana. They didn't let him stop working, and there he is born. He was so big it broke his shoulder, and back then there was nothing they could do. So he had this arm. You remember Gina? And the arm just stayed at his side. He could do little things with it. He'd get his knife out of his pocket and little things, but he couldn't use that arm. It was withered, right? Atrophied is the word we use. Dried up. Can y'all think of a better description of man since Adam's fall? What do we do? Luke says now, hey, go back over to Luke 6 because Luke adds something here that's important. Luke 6, 6. He says, It came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. Now what is the right hand the picture of in Scripture? The, the principle. Yeah, it's the, it's the primary hand. It's power. It's the hand that symbolizes work, what we do. Remember, a man's got a seal in his right hand, and the Jews were marked in the right hand. So this man's right hand is withered. What can he not do? Not much. Not much. He can't work. He look. It's not scripture, but the Jewish they have a the gospel of the Hebrews. It's called, and I know it's 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 not even apocryphal. It's something to. But anyway, they claim he was a stonemason and had suffered an injury, and now he couldn't work. I, who knows whether that's true or not? But the one thing the man symbolizes is a man that cannot work. What happened to us when the fall of Adam? What work can we do for God? <laughs> Nothing. And yet we're told that in Christ Jesus we are created new creatures, right? Created for what? <laughs> Unto good works, which God hath before ordained. So when's the first work a person ever does that's pleasing to God? Once you say, matter of fact, the very first work that any of us ever do as far as uh, and, and a proof of it, it's believe. I'm not saying believing is a work that we're saved by our works. I'm telling you that it's the first thing we ever do that pleases God, is believe on Him. Belief comes from the gift of faith. And so at that point, we begin being able to do something, don't we? So when Christ heals this man, we've got that sort of a picture. But now watch verse 7. The scribes and the Pharisees watched Him. You know, they had their Sabbath day that they couldn't do anything on, but they're okay setting a watch and sending spies following Christ, aren't they? It says, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. Again, isn't it amazing to think about the blindness of, of man? Y'all know when we've got our heart set against something, you know, there, there's an old saying that uh, a man that is uh, convinced against his will remains unconvinced still. Y'all ever heard that? In other words, you can prove something to somebody, but if it's their will to go on doing what they want to do, what are they going to do? They ain't going to go on doing it. Would a miracle convince them? Does he heal this man's arm right in front of them? Yeah. And yet what happens? They don't pay any attention to it. 
No attention at all. Even Nicodemus said, we know you came from God, right? Y'all see, when the heart is set to do something, folks, we're going to do it. I mean, it's just amazing. I had an English bulldog, and this he was the, a smart dog. and just. But I'll tell y'all something. When he made up his mind he was going to do something, he was going to do it. And I don't care what you did, he was going to do it. Wasn't he, Lexi? He, Lexi didn't want him in a room. Shut the door. Don't go in that room. You come home, that door would be busted open, and there he'd be laying up on that bed. And you know what he eventually did? He eventually knocked the door casing loose off the wall. I had to fix it. He would go beat it with his head and shoulder till it opened up. He had 50 other places to sleep. No, he wanted to sleep there. And that's kind of how we are. When we have our heart set on something, you're not going to turn from it. Folks, when we have our heart set on the world, look, I understand this is as good as I understand anything, and that's not really much, but I know something. I was so determined that I was going to be uh, successful and make money and I was going to do it. I would get up at 3.30 in the morning. I would spend the first three hours drawing and doing all the ordering, billing, all that I had to do, whatever I had. And then I'd get out and I'd work like a dog from can to can, pass that in the dark, come home by about 10 o'clock at night and get up the next morning and go do it again. And I did it for years. Why? You wanted to do it. I wanted it. I thought that mattering in this life meant you got to have, right? And so I wanted it and nothing was going to deter me from it. What did these Pharisees want more than anything? Obedience. Right. They, they, wanted, they wanted obedience to the law. They wanted to be right. But I'll tell you all what was the most important thing in the world. You remember on The Chosen when they come walking by? What did the people do? They all bow down and honor them. They wanted that glory, that position. Don't we all like a pat on the back? Yeah. I'll tell you what they do. Gene, they were doing this, right? Here, I'm a Pharisee. Look at me. And so nothing Jesus was going to do that day was going to deter them because what was sitting on the throne of their heart? Self. Folks, we're all like that. We will remain that way unless God intervenes. And so here's Christ. You've got this man that's withered, his arms withered. How long will he be unable to work? The rest of his life unless Christ intervenes. And Christ intervenes. And he does it on a Sabbath day. Y'all reckon that's a coincidence? No. So here he comes in. He comes in, the man's got the withered arm. Now the Pharisees, by the way, one of the things they taught in their in their rules is it was illegal to seek medical help on a Sabbath day unless life was at stake. They would make, that's the only way. So this man's life is not at stake. So really, what is it that they would prefer this day? They would prefer this man to remain crippled. What does that say to us? Folks, that's as cruel as you can get. I mean, seriously. I mean, you know, they keep, I hear for every few years you hear how that they have a cure for cancer, but they ain't about to come out with it. I, don't, I wouldn't doubt that a bit, but I know one thing. There's nobody going to create a car that runs on water. I'm sure they could. They make things run on. We had things on the submarine were powered by water, but by splitting it, hydrogen and whatnot. Why do we know that we are not going to have a water-powered car? Because there ain't no money in it. It's free fuel, right? These Pharisees were looking at this man. The power was in front of them for Jesus to heal him. Whether they believed it or not, they knew he was working miracles because they've already sent Nicodemus to him. And yet they would prefer for this man to go on in that condition rather than Christ to break their tradition. Now that's downright cruel, isn't it? Does that sound like the love of God? And so what happens is Christ exposes them and that's why they hate Him. They didn't hate Him so much because He was a better teacher. They envied Him. They hated Him because He exposed them. And who likes to be exposed? Nobody. So Christ comes along. Now here are the Jews, again, wanting to stop this from happening. You know, this is a perfect picture, if you think of it, of what tradition and religion does of men. Remember, there's a case over in Acts 13. I had thought, I, we got a long ways to go, but maybe after Luke we'll just go right into Acts because we'll get Luke's part two, all the history. Acts is wonderful. But I had thought uh, of the, the, there's a similar thing. Paul in Acts 13 goes to a place where there's a man, 
a Gentile, governor of the island, and this man's trying to worship God, the God of the Jews. So he's attached himself to a Jewish teacher who's a false prophet. Bar Jesus. He's calling himself the son of, of Joshua, right? And this man comes, Paul comes into town, and Paul really has the power, doesn't he? Do y'all remember what Bar Jesus tried to do when the governor wanted to hear Paul? Turn, turn him away. He tried to keep him away from him. Why? He wants to maintain his power over him. Maintain his control, his position, right? And so here you've got an unbeliever, unbelieving Jew, trying to stop a Gentile from coming to see, you know, the Word of God. And it's the same thing that's happened in this day. Christ is there and can heal this man, and the religious world would like to stop that. Okay, so here, here we move on. Verse 8. It says, He knew their thoughts, and He said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. He, this is, I, I love this. Not let's go do it in the corner. Not step into a box and come out whole. Get up and stand in front of everybody. Folks, that is not how Benny Hinn does it, is it? it? You don't see this anywhere. You know, the whole charismatic movement started in our country, really. It started before this, but it really got kicked off out in Los Angeles. Folks, anything that comes out of Los Angeles, beware of it, okay? <laughs> Just beware. But it started in Los Angeles with a man that stuck his head inside a shoebox and claimed he heard God's voice. And that's how it kind of started going. Wouldn't you be suspect of that? I mean, how, and seriously, how did God speak to prophets in the Bible? He spoke, right? <laughs> but these Jews here come, and they, they want to keep Christ from healing this man, and Christ on the Sabbath day says, stand out in the middle of the room right here. Everybody's going to see. You see, He is forcing the issue, isn't He? And so it says in verse 8, he arose and stood forth. Verse 9, Jesus said unto them, He said, I'll ask you one thing. Now, I love these questions He asked them. Now, watch this question because it's like most of them He asked the unbelievers. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? Now, just ask someone that believes in God the question, which is right, to do good or to do evil? To do good. To do good, certainly, right? Well, is it right every day? What day? What would the Sabbath day matter? It doesn't matter a bit. So he's put them in a position here. You know, every time he would ask these questions where he had someone on the spot, they don't answer. Now, they don't say, gee, I don't know, or I'm not sure. They don't answer at all. What does that tell you each time? And they did not know anything. They don't know, but folks, they know they don't know, and they know their answer will entrap them. He, me and Lexi know a fellow that is a... He, uh, Sully knows him to it. They love to argue over the Bible. I mean, they, they love to have these... Just it's, a, it's the most miserable thing you've ever been around, and yet they, they just love it, and they want to get you, and so they, they say, well, you believe such and such. You say, yeah, I do. And they say something, you say, well, let me ask you a question then. In such and such verse, what does that mean? And the guy would answer each question like this. He'd go, uh, mm, like that. You know what he was, remember how he would do that, Lexi? You know what he was doing? Kind of an stalling to avoid. He's stalling to avoid, but he's thinking his answer over real quick, easy and, and, and properly because he knows something. If he answers the question, he's going to incriminate himself. Seriously, I mean, that's all it is. And they want to fight and argue over these verses, and they come up with all these different things. He, he One time asking me something about, you know, well, uh, about the, it's always about the second coming, too. It's all this, they've all got it figured out and the date set and all, and he says something. And I asked him one time, I said, just point blank, well, let me ask you, what is the last trump? Now, do you have any problem answering what the last trump must be? It is the last one, isn't it? Can there be any trumpets after the last trump? He wouldn't answer the question. You see, if he answered the question, his, his doctrine would be exposed. But he ain't willing to give up that doctrine. 
He's got a little thing he's wrote about that thick. Gave it to me one time and said, check this out. So I went through the first few pages and he wanted me to and I made notes. Well, this isn't according to this and even the math was wrong in it and stuff. And I said, I didn't come up with what you come up with. And I started showing him. He said, ah, let's not talk about that. Let's, you know, the point is the Pharisees had their religion. They loved it. They had their position. They loved it. It was the most important thing in the world to them. Therefore, were they going to accept Christ? No. They that are whole need no physician. Folks, they were perfectly happy with their position. It's why when you preach the gospel to people and, and the, a person says they believe and the requirements of, of a believer in our life, the application starts to come forth, what happens? You'll find people will, will get away from you. I mean, they will. People will just... It, I've seen it so many times. The yeah, they'll change the subject, sure, but I'll tell you what happens lots of times in assemblies. People will just remove themselves and they'll start seeking reasons to remove themselves. Is that, is that true, Lexi? You can see it coming. Well, you get so used to it, they start looking for something to get mad at you about. And it, folks, don't hold it against them. What's happening is the Word of God's poking in the spot that hurts. So what do we do? We try and get away from it. And they start seeking a reason not to hear this stuff anymore, and they, they, they'll go. There's nothing you can do about it, but just keep preaching the truth. And you say, well, why would you do that? Well, I can tell you I used to do it. I used to stay away from it. They're forced to flock together. Yes, they are. If they want any kind of fellowship. That's, that's right. Yeah. I found myself flocking with them. Yeah. Although we were all wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. The only difference, uh, Sully, there's we're all wrong about stuff. But there's those that know they're wrong and say it and those that won't say it. You know, it's a whole lot easier not to uh, ever take a fall if you don't set yourself up high. I mean, you know, if you say, look, I'm wrong. Yeah, sure, I might be wrong. Absolutely. Well, show me where I'm wrong. And if it show me where I'm wrong and if it's right, I'll make the correction. I don't want to be right for you. I want to be right with God. But what these Pharisees do, they're not going to receive Christ even though He perform a miracle in front of them. You remember what He said about them? He said, remember when uh, Jesus is given in the, in the example of the rich man and Lazarus? And the rich man goes to hell, remember? There he is in hell. He had everything. It's all he cared about. And boom, he's in hell. I suspect it's the same rich man from a couple chapters before that said, boy, look at this. I've had this. I'm going to build new barns and, you know, retirement. And then he dies that night, doesn't he? There he is in hell. He lifts up his eyes and sees Lazarus. He sees the spiritual realm and there's poor old Lazarus that was, had nothing and yet he's with Abraham, with Christ and Abraham's bosom. Everything's great. And he says, send somebody to my brothers that they don't come to this place. And do you all remember what the answer was? He said, though one go to them from the dead, they will not believe. Now who came from the dead and the Jews refused to believe? Christ. Folks, no matter what Christ did this day, these men were not going to believe. And they're not going to believe because they are already satisfied with their position, their station. They're not hungering after anything. They don't lack anything. They are absolutely satisfied. And perfect. And perfect. That's right. Now watch what he does here. Again, he says in verse 9, I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? Okay. Now, what's the answer to that question? It's always right to do good and right to save life. Right? You see how he's putting them on the spot? How would any of these men, if they never came to believe, and look, we don't know. Paul could have been one of the Pharisees there. We don't know. But if they never came to believe, when they stand before the Lord, how could they not say they didn't know what they were doing? Again. You know what they're wanting to do this day? They're not only wanting to keep the man from getting healed, they're wanting to destroy Christ. Is that right or wrong? What law could they come up with to say that was right? None. Then how can they justify themselves? They justify themselves saying that a man that would do this could not be the Messiah. That's right. I'm going to put it in modern terms because Mr. Bailey really summed it up. This man does not keep our traditions. Therefore, this man has to go to hell. 
Now, do y'all know anybody that thinks that way? What denomination are you? I get asked this all the time. Yeah. You, oh, what denomination are you? Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? What do they mean? They mean I'm right. My, my part. Look, you, one of the things you have to learn when you read church history. I learned this a, a, a while ago and I'm thankful for this. When you read church history, read it like a history and don't try and figure out who's right or wrong. Because I tell you what you'll find, God's got His people in every walk of life. And you're never going to find one sect that's got it all right. It's not like that. So read your histories and just see. But what they say about Christ is, if He doesn't do it our way, He's got to be wrong. Because what's the alternative? We're wrong. They're not going to say that. And so they condemn Christ, don't they? And now, uh, as, as Christ goes on with this, notice what He says in verse 9. It says, Looking round about upon them all. In my mind, I can picture Him giving them a long pause here. Waiting on an answer. Huh? Who's going to answer? Nobody will say a word. Don't you know that if you won't talk about something or answer something that you're incriminating yourself in your own conscience? Why don't they want to answer? They know they'll incriminate themselves. Then what must they know? They're guilty. Folks, they're seeking Him, following Him, figuring out what can we get on this guy to kill Him. How could they claim they're keeping God's law when the law is summed up in love your neighbor as yourself? They, they won't. But what does their tradition do? It twists the law to where they can claim they're doing good. Now, verse 11 says, or verse 10, Looking round about the, uh, on them, He said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. Y'all know I love this. Faith is involved here. Now, what would make this man that can't move his arm try and move his arm? Faith. Where'd faith come from? God. God. And the man, for no human reason possible, raises up his hand. And what's he find out? It's good. It's restored. Did he need physical therapy? Did the Lord tell him, look, I want you to take plenty of amino acids and you come back and see me next week? He was healed like that, wasn't he? Verse 11, they were filled with madness. Folks, they were so angry. The word means they were out of their mind. Y'all ever, we, we've all seen somebody. He, my granny used to use the phrase, a conniption fit. I never knew what that meant. But I was always accused of a, having a conniption fit. What did that mean, Gina? Just what you're trying to describe. Just yeah. losing it. Folks, they are so mad they can't even think straight. Right? It says, They were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. And yet, what are they all doing it all in? The name of religion. Hey, I got a quote I wanted to read if I can... I thought I wrote it down. All right. Men never do so much evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from a religious conviction. Isn't that the truth? What are some of the most heinous crimes that have ever been committed are committed from what? Some kind of a... Deserve God. Why did Hitler kill all the Jews? Christ killers, he called them. That's how he justified what he wanted to do. Christ killers. He said he was retaliating for Christ. Anybody believe that? No. Folks, these Jews do not care about Moses' law. The truth is, they don't even care about their own traditions. They care about their position and their life. In other words, how do you know that their traditions really weren't that important to them? Because when they wanted to break them, they found loopholes to break them. I told y'all about the toothbrush. They couldn't carry. They were not to bear a burden. Jeremiah said that the Jews had, uh, had borne burdens on the Sabbath day. In other words, they'd work, right? Carrying loads and doing their stuff. So they were told not to bear a burden on the Sabbath day. Do you know how they got around that? They would tie it to their body and claim it was clothing. I'm serious. They're not supposed to carry anything. Well, you, you don't want to carry up. You know what? I got a... Uh, I think about the Navy, a sea pack. Y'all ever seen a sea bag? Man, a sea bag is huge. That thing weighed about 80 pounds loaded up, didn't it, Tony? 75. 75? And you know what you do with everything you own? Because it's everything you own's in there. You pack it up on your back and you walk with it. The Jew would do that. But what did he claim? Oh, no, this is, it looks good. It goes with my attire. I told y'all about storing his toothbrush or his goods so he could, you know, when we want to do something, we'll justify it. 
Well, what does that tell us? It tells us we're, our guilt, doesn't it? Doesn't it tell us that there's something that we're wanting to do and our religion isn't that important we're going to do it? And yet they're wanting to kill Jesus for breaking the traditions that they themselves break when it fits them. I mean, this is horrible, isn't it? If you and I had been raised in the Jewish religion, do you think you and I would have done different? Folks, we'd have been doing the same exact thing. If God had not intervened, we'd do just what they did and we'd have killed Him too. And I know that to be true because the first part of my life I spent hating God and running from Him. You know, Martin Luther said when he was under such bad conviction, someone said something about loving God. And Luther said, love Him. I have days when I hate Him. Why? Making Him do things that He didn't want to do. It was contrary to His nature. He was under conviction. These Jews are like that and they're not going to accept Christ. Now, I want you all to turn over and let's read a, a passage real quick. Go to Mark 3. Because this really tells you the depth that they sink to. Now, they're always accusing the Lord Jesus Christ. First off, they said, He's unclean. He doesn't wash His hands when He eats like we require. Next, they said, What is He doing eating with publicans and sinners? Now, they hated the publican because the publican was a, a Roman sympathizer, right? So they said, This man can't be the Messiah because of his manner of life. Essentially, isn't that the justice they used? Yeah. How could this man be the Messiah? He's not a Pharisee. How can this man claim to be who he claims to be when we saw this man sitting with a bunch of tax collectors? You see, in their mind, that disqualified him. Why? Anyone that would associate with a tax collector must be what? No. An unclean devil going to hell. That was their, their policy. Well, how bad did they hate Christ? Watch in Mark's account 3. It says, uh, verse, we'll read from 5. When he had looked round about on them with anger, Christ had was anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Who did they go meet up with? The Greek, Greek speaking. The Herodians? Mm -hmm. Folks, was Herod a Jew? No. Folks, Herod's of Esau. How bad did they hate Christ? You eat with publicans. They go meet with the Herodians. You see, they don't practice what they preach, do they? Why? Because it wasn't that important to them. Their, their actual doctrine was not that important to them. What was important to them was maintaining their position and their way of life. And that's what we find God will do with, with us. We're, we get saved and God will bring things into competition with Himself. I mean, y'all think about it. Right now, it's Sunday morning. You woke up and immediately things come into competition with God, don't they? What happens? Y'all know? Hey, I'll give you an example. We say the Sabbath day is for resting. Well, Archie Bunker said it. He sat in his recliner and watched football all day keeping the Sabbath day. Is that what it was for? You see what he was really doing? He was claiming he was, he was using God to justify wanting to sit there. When you, I have a man told me a few months ago that he would go in for all of this, is how he said it, if it just didn't have to be done on Sunday. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, Sunday's for golfing. Now, what's he telling me? Golf came into competition with God and golf wins. Now, what are you going to say to God at the judgment seat? Seriously, I mean, what will we say? We all know this. Look, things come in with competition with God constantly. And so many times you and I fail, don't we? And yet God in His love and mercy, if we're saved, doesn't cast us out. Now, we'll bring chastisement on ourselves. And lots of things can happen. But what about a lost person? Folks, a lost person continually puts the things of this world before the thing of God. Because the Bible says God is not honestly in all their thoughts. In other words, I would have God as long as He'll let me have this too. Well, if that's your opinion and you're saved, God is going to take that thing from you, whatever it is. And thank God He does, because if it was up to our own power, we wouldn't. We wouldn't turn from it. 
Now think of the, the most famous Pharisee in all the Bible. Anytime you read about the Pharisees, always come back to this. Who is the most famous Pharisee in all the Bible? Paul. Saul of Tarsus, right? Was Saul happy in his religion? Folks, Saul was killing people and he loved it. Now you say it doesn't say that. He said he gained by the things he was doing. Who was the big man in the eyes of the people? Paul. Y'all know we like that, don't we? It, Paul was the one, everybody, oh, Paul, thank you. You're fighting for our religion. You're protecting us. He, I sometimes wonder to use an example or not, but he, I was being put out of a church physically. Now, Wayne is my witness. And this little guy got behind me and started pushing me, and he told all the people, he stopped. Remember that, Wayne? And I just knew... Don't do anything. I knew that. Don't. You'll be so sorry. Leave out of here with, you know, don't. And he pushed me and he turned around and he looked at the congregation. He said, y'all see that? I'm like Paul. Didn't he, Wayne? And I thought to myself, holy cow. You're like Paul. You see what he really meant? I'm fighting for y'all. And y'all know the people liked it. They did. They loved it. Oh yeah, he's fighting for us. Folks, that was Paul. Paul was fighting for the Pharisees' religion and he was a big man. He was at the top. I mean, this guy was the cream of the crop. Was he going to give that up? No. no but, but he did. <laughs> he did, but Trish said it. Say it again, Trish. Not on his own. own. <clears throat> y'all know what happened. He did not come under a, uh, an attack of conscience and spend many a sleepless night debating what to do. When God got ready, when the due time come, what did God do? Knocked him down. He knocked him to the ground, folks. God put something in Paul, and Paul could never be the same. Because if he tried to hang on to that, what happened? He's got this other new thing now that agitates. And he's got these two natures and they're button going against each other. And what did Paul say he finally had to do with all of that? He counted it but dung. What, what was Paul calling dung? The Pharisees' law and tradition. Folks, that law and tradition, and Paul was sincere about it. He says he was sincere. But what was the thing about it that really appealed to him? The popularity. The popularity and the position. Folks, this was the man people looked up to. He come right. Hey, ask Paul. He'll know. And so here's Paul. He's he's at the top of his at the food chain in his society, isn't he? But what did it all amount to? It's nothing, folks. Jesus said, "What did a man gain if he gains the whole world and lose your own soul? What is your most prized possession? Your soul. I mean, riches over soul." Relaxing over soul, football over soul. And I'm not trying to, uh, to, to condemn y'all because look, I'm right in the same boat with you. But the thing we've got to remember is all these things in our mind, put them into competition with God because that's what God's doing. Set the thing next to God. You know, when I have to help someone that's struggling with something, I usually go about it. I, 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 it's the hardest part of anything I ever have to do because I'm just not suited for it naturally. And I heard Martin Jones, Martin Lloyd Jones uh, teaching classes on preaching and he gave good advice. But he said, the thing to do is sit down with someone and whatever the thing is that's bothering them, get it out in the open in front of you. Put it down in writing, whatever it is, right? And you sit it there and you say, okay, now, what is this really? For instance, that man told me golf, right? Okay, golf. There it is. It's sitting there. Now, what is so great about this golf? Well, it's fun. Okay. You finish golfing. Let's say you golfed and you shot a 59, right? That would be the course record anywhere. I think that'd be the lowest score ever. You just shot the lowest score in the history of golf, right? Well, with that, and, and what, you go, I mean, what do you do with it? You brag on it. You can brag on it. <laughs> you can get some glory from it. But what's it going to do you in eternity? How long will you be able to enjoy it? Not long. Pick anything it is. Folks, money is the best example. He, we started the parables. Derek and them wanted to go over the parables he's been asking. So we started going over the parables at their house. And I said, I'm going to go ahead and tell you all, you ain't going to like it. A third of the parables are about money in one way or another. 
And essentially what you find out, I mean, y'all think about money. I remember my granny had Confederate money. Did she ever show you that? She had a shoebox with Confederate money. She had, a, she had a room called the junk room. And I wasn't allowed in the junk room. But every so often she'd go in there and I'd follow her and look around. And she had some Confederate money her dad had given her in a, in a shoebox. And I thought she was rich. I looked and I said, well, Granny, why don't you this or that? And she started laughing. She said, that ain't no good. And I said, but it's money. Well, it was at one point. But what happened to it? Overnight, it wasn't backed by anything. It's gone. Y'all realize a dollar? Look, our dollar, that's going to happen too soon anyway. But even if it don't, when you take your last breath, what good's your dollar? Not a bit. You know, it's going to go. You say, well, I'm doing it for my kids. Okay, then what do you, how long is that going to last? It doesn't matter. No matter what it is, it doesn't matter. What is the thing that God created man for back here? His sole purpose was to do what? To have a relationship with God. Well, what do you want to have over here? A relationship with God. Then what is a relationship with the world going to matter? It's not. Always look at the things that we're struggling with as being in competition with God. If you take the, the thing and you put it there, the way to do it is whatever it is. Oh, what you, uh, you know, okay, we'll say golf. All right. Well, I would love to try and worship God, but this golf. All right, put golf there. And then put the cross on the other side and stand back and look at it and say, well, now let's see. What did golf ever do for me? Well, I enjoy it. I get to drink a few beers. I, I hang out with my friends. That's nice. I enjoy that. But what did Christ ever do for me? Everything. He gave His life for us, folks. He left glory and gave everything. Can you imagine the position we'd be in if the, Christ would have said to the Father, Well, Father, I'd go down there and become flesh and do this, but you know, I, got, I like to golf every now and then. <laughs> I know that's silly, but can you imagine? You know, we're told that He counted where He was at, His position, His glory. He counted it not a thing to be grasped, to be hung on to. In other words, He had the right and the privilege to hang on to what He had because it was everything. And yet, what did He do? He gave it up to come down here and do this. And now I'm going to stand before Him over here and say, Well, I would have worshipped you, but it meant giving up golf. How could that person say they're not guilty? How could that person not say when they're cast into hell that God has been just? We would be getting exactly what we deserve, wouldn't we? And so God will be justified that day. And He said we'll be, our own words will, will uh, testify against us. Now back to the Pharisees here. Did the Pharisees have the validation that Christ's teaching was true? Yes, they did. They had enough sign to understand. Yes. He just told them, your understanding of the Sabbath day is wrong. And then he proved with the miracle. So what should they have said that day? Wait, Whoa. this goes against everything I've ever thought all my life. This goes against all our traditions. But this man just did this thing. You see how they are without excuse. Folks, we're the same way. When, when you come to see the truth in the Scripture, no matter what all your traditions and everything amount to, no matter what it is, when you see the truth in the Scripture, what do we have to say? Now, wait a minute. This is what God said. It doesn't matter what Grandma said. It's what God said. Folks, Granny can be wrong, can't she? And so we've got to make sure that we don't put our trust in traditions and in, you know, old, old, lots of times in our country we talk about the old time religion. Just because the old folks did it doesn't make it right. Just because you've always done it don't make it right. What makes it right is because Christ says it's right. And when Christ says it's right, then that which is the opposite of it is wrong. And so this is what he's proven to these Pharisees. And you can prove it to people constantly. I've told y'all one time I was sharing the gospel with a woman and she claimed to have a, a secret language from God. Now that makes us feel good. I can do this or I can heal or I can speak. And, and we like that and it makes us feel important. When you show a scripture that clearly goes the other way, what do the people do usually? This particular lady told me she took her hands and grabbed like this and she said, you're not taking this from me. Think about that. In order for me to believe what that says about Christ, I would have to quit believing what I believe about myself and my special ability. Now, would you like to choose something that silly to go to hell over? No. Isn't that horrible? 
And yet, folks, that's what sinners do. And it's all we're able to do unless God steps in. Without the election of God, nothing happens. We're like the man with the withered hand. Okay? All right, any questions? Nope. All right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for intervening on our behalf, Lord. We thank You for the grace and the mercy that it took to do these things. We thank You for the love that You shed on us constantly. We ask that You open our hearts and minds and convict us of sin in our life, Lord, that You show us the way to walk in Your path, that You lead us of the Spirit and enable us to do the things that are pleasing in Your sight, not for our own sake, Lord, but for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave everything for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.